Good afternoon, everyone. I'm John Devineau, President of the Board of Directors of the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. Thank you for joining us for our first talk of the new year. Today we have Dan Bullen, who is, with, uh, who is the author of the new book, Daniel Shea's Honorable Rebellion, An American Story. I think the key word here is honorable, as we will soon find out. Please be aware that we are trying something new today. For technical reasons, this talk will be pre-recorded. However, Dan will be available to discuss with you and answer questions immediately after the talk via Zoom. If you are on our mailing list, you should have al already received a link to a Zoom session. If you do not have that link, send me an email at devinal13 at comcast.net and we'll send you the link. Uh, before we begin, I would like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. And uh, without them, we would, our museum functions would really not uh, be possible. So we would like to thank BurlingtonCars.com, 802 Cars, Vermont Humanities, AARP Vermont, and Home Light Investment. At this time, I would like to introduce our speaker. Uh, Dan has earned his PhD in American Literature from New York University. He is the author of The Dangers of Passion, The Transcendental Friendship of Ralph Waldo Emerson and Margaret Fuller, and The Love Lies of the Artists, Five Stories of Creative Intimacy. He currently lives in East Hampton, Massachusetts. All right, Dan, take it away. Okay, thanks so much. Um, thanks to John Devineau and the uh, Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. Um, it's a real pleasure to be able to give this talk. I've been working on this book for, oh, years, and um, it's always beautiful to uh, get a chance to come out and tell the story. Um, I feel like I found a story that wasn't um, really well known. Um, I, as I say in the uh, preface to this book, I found this story on the side of the road. I literally saw a sign that said Daniel Shea's highway and wondered who this Daniel Shays fellow was. So I came home and started reading. Um, and um, let me just keep you up there so that I keep making eye contact. Um, but I need to see the slides. Uh, so the more I read about this story, the more I found that um, the story that people lived had been kind of obscured by the history uh, as people had told it. Um, the story I kept having to dig through was that Shays' Rebellion was the unrest that led to the Constitution. Angry farmers created a disturbance in Vermont, and this scared the founding fathers who saw that they needed to create a stronger federal government, and therefore now we have the Constitution. And that story was told as kind of a, a warning story about the dangers of poor people organizing. Um, and the more I looked into this story, uh, it was 2012 when I found it, Bernie Sanders was just getting on the scene, Occupy had just happened. Um, what I kept finding was that the people looked a lot less threatening than the stories were, were giving them credit for. Um, what I found was five months of nonviolent anti-austerity protests. The farmers showed up in very organized protests, never threw a stone through a courthouse window. Um, and they ultimately won their cause. They won in elections. I'm giving the end of the story away, but they won their cause in elections, uh, peaceful elections, uh, two months after they were scattered by um, the government's army. And um, the, everything went back to, you know, whatever normal was at the time without the, um, without the panic. But um, when you look at the correspondence between the elites, George Washington, Henry Knox, um, Stephen Higginson, James Bowden, governor of Massachusetts, um, you find that the panic that they generated as a result of these protests uh, was really useful for them, uh, for their purposes in, um, in pushing this agenda and updating the Articles of Confederation and turning that into the Constitution. Um, so what I'd like to share with you is um, kind of less of the book. I'm, I can, I'm happy to talk about what I've done in the book. I tried to tell a people's history of, this, um, of these events. Uh, kind of from the people's perspective, less with less of the, you know, the distant, aloof historian voice, um, and just, you know, show the story as it happened on the ground <clears throat> um, to the people who, um, who lived through it. 
Um, so this story started in, um, it started an economic crisis. It started after the war was over. Uh, the Northern War ended in 1780. Then 1783, they concluded the peace uh, at, um, in Paris. And Massachusetts, like all, all of the other states, was, was in bad shape economically. Um, the state had carried 100,000 pounds worth of debt before the war. Um, after fielding 92,000 soldiers and 38 regiments, they owed debts of 1.5 million uh, pounds after the war. And this is a state where, as you can see, tax receipts, annual tax receipts were about 60,000 pounds. So um, they were going to have a hard time paying that uh, nonetheless. Um, a lot of other states and the federal government, as such as it was at the time, depreciated those debts. Um, but in Massachusetts, that was a fight they were having was to see whether they were going to pay those debts um, in full or in part or in what part. This crisis was also exacerbated by a British decision in January of 1784 to pass navigation acts that closed uh, American shipping off from the West Indies ports. The West Indies ports were the, the destination for a lot of American goods and a lot of New England's goods, the timber, the beef, um, that was all going down to the West Indies. And we could tell the story of what that was being used for in the West Indies, but that's part of a different talk <laughs> for another day. Um, but that economic crisis affected all 13 states. Uh, it was only in Massachusetts, though, that we end up with, um, you know, the people taking direct action, uh, bringing guns to the courthouses. Um, I should say also that that 1784 uh, decision triggered a, a, what they call the chain of debt pulling tight across New England. So merch American merchants had imported goods from England. Their warehouses in New Haven and Boston and along the coast were filled with this British merchandise. They owed small payments. The, the British allowed them to buy on credit. So they owed payments that they had to make every month to keep up on the goods that they had in their warehouses. And when this crisis came in, or when this crisis came along, they couldn't make money by selling those goods uh, or selling other goods in um, the Indies. So the merchants who sold those goods didn't have money to pay the, the merchants and distributors. And all of a sudden there was no money for anybody to pay their debts. Um, and everyone ultimately turned on the farmers who also had, you know, were carrying debts to the merchants, but the farmers were where the buck stopped. Uh, literally the buck ran out. <laughs> because um, they typically traded in goods and produce and tender, and they didn't have paper money very often and certainly didn't have the hard coin um, that would let them pay the debts, which is what the British were demanding. Um, and currency policy in the colonies and the revolutionary era is also another talk for another time. Um, so as this crisis came down, John Hancock is the governor of Massachusetts. He was Massachusetts' first governor in 1780. By 1784, 1785, he's trying to issue paper money to depreciate these debts. He's trying to pass a tender law. And um, elites in the Senate are keeping that from happening. And in 1785, in April, they had an election. And John Hancock was um, he kind of stepped out in the, right before the election happened, actually. He saw that he wasn't going to win. So James Bowden and a cadre of powerful merchants took over. And really, I think it took a long time for me to find this out in my research, but I think one of the most important things I learned in researching this book was that a lot of this crisis started because all of the British administrators who had governed Massachusetts from the time it was founded until the, the revolution had left and gone back to England. And that left a vacuum for people with administrative experience um, and so what you get was basically like private equity guys, you know, wealthy merchants coming up and stepping into government roles. And they just didn't have the experience um, kind of maintaining strong relationships with the people. And they kind of drove the state into this crisis. Um, that's James Bowden is on the left there. And to the right there is Samuel Adams, who was one of Bowden's chief advisors. Um, and the way that they proposed to, um, to solve this economic crisis um, was to pay all of the state's debts in full. This triggered some outrage among the people. Um, the farmers, as I say here, were not just angry about taxes. They were angry about the fact that they were being taxed to pay war debts um, in which they themselves were creditors. They had lent the state value in their service. They'd never been paid. 
they served, they lost friends, they lost limbs, um, they came back traumatized as people do from war. Um, and they had originally been paid in, in worthless paper money that lost its value as soon as it was printed. Um, they were ultimately paid in um, promissory notes. They were told even paid in IOUs. And at the end of the war, they sold those notes to whoever would give them hard coin for them or any coin or any value for them. So they sold them to their generals, they sold them to shopkeepers, they sold them to wealthy merchants, and they sold them for two to three shillings on the pound, so 10 to 15% of their value. But those notes stayed in circulation because they still represented value. And the value rose and fell depending on rumors about whether they were going to be paid by the government or at what, at what rate. But nevertheless, they were circulating and men were buying them up, buying them up by the thousands, James Bowden, the governor at this point, owns 2,990 pounds of these notes. And this is at a time when you can buy a farm of 70 acres or farm of 100 acres for 70 pounds, right? So um, the, the regular people who earned that pay are watching this value build up. And this is all taking place in the newspapers. There are exchanges where these rates are all published. Everybody knows that this is what's happening. Um, also, 35 men at this point uh, by 1785 own 40% of the notes. So when they vote, they have a vested interest in it. And when they vote to pay those notes in full, they're basically voting to pay themselves windfall profits. And when they vote to pay themselves windfall profits and the people can't pay, those people are gonna lose their farms. They're gonna be seized by the courts. The courts are gonna then sell them at auction and the people with money can then buy those farms up at a discount of, you know, 33 to 50%, or sorry, buy them up at a third to a half of its value. Um, so just to be clear, as you see in the text box there, the people had given up the value of their own war pay, and they were now being asked to pay taxes to pay that value to speculators who had never fought. So I wouldn't call that angry about taxes. That's not like we need to build a new wharf, so we're gonna tax the people to do it. This was really an explicit injustice that was being perpetrated on the people of Massachusetts and they resented it. And they felt like they hadn't just fought a war at great expense to themselves and their farms uh, in order to come home and, and be treated this way and really be shown this kind of disrespect. So they gathered at the, um, taverns of Massachusetts. This is a recreation of Conkey's Tavern, which was in Pelham, Massachusetts, which was one of the kind of epicenters of opposition. Uh, there were many. This was not, you know, one man's crusade. Daniel Shays didn't, you know, lead the farmers on a crusade, although that was one of the fears they generated. Um, the hearthstone in this image was original. Everything else here is a recreation. Um, but to give you a sense of the flavor, um, and in these taverns, um, the people are reading the uh, newspapers, which are tacked to the walls there, and they were all literate. There's high, very high rates of literacy among these farmers. And they're reading the newspapers, which are filled with editorials um, on either side of the issue. The farmers are saying things like, uh, you know, complaining that they were that they were being loaded with class rates and lawsuits, pulled and hauled by sheriffs, constables, and collectors. And they were, their land was being sold for about one third of its value, our cattle for half. I've been obliged to pay and nobody will pay me, one farmer complained. Um, again, this was open knowledge. 19 parts of 20 of the public securities were possessed by merchants and opulent gentlemen in the maritime towns, one fellow complained. And the complaint was that they were accumulating fortunes by the general distress. And this is a complaint <laughs> in Massachusetts that you hear to this day. Um, that Massachusetts is split and that Eastern Mass uh, and the city in Boston just are disconnected to the values of Western Mass and that our Western Mass um, interests aren't considered as much as they might be. Um, there did start to be um, calls in these newspapers for action on this. Um, some people, you know, this is one of the other quotes is um, that we should rise up and put a stop to it and have no more courts, nor sheriffs, nor collectors, nor lawyers. Um, they were afraid that the taxes, that this tax burden would turn them into a miserable, cruel hearted and wicked people. So this is the people trying to rally support in the populace of newspaper readers um, for their cause and trying to get people to see that there's been an injustice taking place here. 
Uh, the merchants' editorials, on the other hand, pretty much ignored the economic realities uh, that led to this crisis. Um, and they accused the farmers of being luxurious in their diet, idle and profligate in their manners, and encouragers of foreign manufacturers. Um, they would sign satirical letters with names like Amos Spendthrift, Tom Seldom Sober, or Simon Dreadwork. Um, and they were really kind of creating this fear, like what we, I think, hear a little bit with the socialists accusations now, that this class of, you know, degenerate people um, were going to threaten every honest landowner. So here's another quote, private property will lie wholly at the mercy of the most idle, vicious, and disorderly set of men in the community. Um, and they created the fear that farmers would overturn the very foundations of our government and constitution and on their ruins ex erect the um, an unprincipled and lawless domination of one man. So this is the fear mongering. If you think that the Facebook comments are <laughs> filled with panic and, and existential crisis now, um, it was pretty much the same in 1786. Um, the farmers took their concerns to their public meeting houses um, starting in 1785, they started writing um, very wordy, uh, very kind of almost groveling petitions, begging for some kind of relief. Uh, the House of Representatives in Massachusetts considered their petitions and looked into them. But the uh, Senate, which was run by the wealthy merchants who had just voted themselves this, this raise, this windfall profit, um, universally shot down any requests for paper money, for tender laws, uh, for depreciation of debts. They just wouldn't let it happen. Um, they sent petitions by the dozen, and it wasn't just um, Pelham. As you can see here, these, these towns in, in green are all the, are a lot of the towns, some of the towns that sent men to these protests. Um, the, the cities outlined in orange, Northampton at the top and Springfield there toward the bottom were where the courts were. Um, this is a period map, so forgive the, uh, the roughness of the map. Um, so, they're sending petitions, they're sending petitions, they're sending petitions. They're hosting in these towns, they're holding meetings. They're constitutionally authorized meetings where they vote to make themselves a constitutionally authorized body. Um, and they hold these town conventions. And this itself was also a threat to the folks in Boston. They saw this as a, um, as a usurpation of the state's authority. So there was some resentment of what took place in these meetings and some kind of uh, discounted anything that came out of them. They just thought that the people in the West were these rough cut folks who didn't need to be taken seriously. Um, so in July, this is really when the, the what's known as Shays Rebellion always starts is July 18th, the legislature adjourned without issuing any reforms whatsoever. So the people started to get together. They decided, okay, we're not gonna petition as individual towns anymore. They sent, uh, 50 towns sent their delegates to Hatfield, which is there and kind of in the center of your screen in blue, just north of Northampton. And they held the Hatfield Convention from August 22nd to 25th of uh, 1786. Um, this has been going on for a year and a half now. The ports have been closed to American shipping since January of 1784. So a lot of people have been letting this thing go on and waiting for um, waiting for relief. And it's when it's just not coming, they finally said, all right, we, we're going to have to consider direct action. They didn't take direct action first. From Hatfield, they sent a petition with those 50 towns. They made 25 demands. Um, they wanted paper money. They wanted reductions in court fees. They wanted to change the way that representation worked. And they wanted to move the capital from Boston inland, inland at least as far as Worcester, so that they had a better chance of participating because sending delegates to Boston for the duration of a session is really expensive if you're a farming town in Western Massachusetts. Um, I've circled Brookfield over there in blue on the right side of your screen. Just, I'll come back to that. That's where Daniel Shea is kind of, where he, part of his story really started. Um, and we'll come back to Springfield as well because that's where he enters this story. Um, but really you can see that with this map that the, the farm towns were up in the hills and the older established towns, like Northampton, I think was 1652. Um, Pelham was 1743, right? So it took a long time for people to work themselves up into these hills. Um, so here's our timeline. The 22nd to 25th, they have this, the Hatfield Convention. Um, on August 29th, 
Um, Daniel Shays was actually asked to lead this first protest to close the foreclosure courts. They were just acting against the, the courts, the judges who were going to allow debts to be adjudicated, which, you know, watching people's farms be foreclosed. Um, Daniel Shays said he didn't want to lead that. It's not clear why he said no. Um, the man who ultimately led was a civil leader, was a, a deacon, John Thompson, led the Pelham contingent. And Luke Day, who was a commissioned officer from um, West Springfield, led 1,500 men. He stood at the top of the courthouse steps and said, you can't hold court today. And um, the forces who showed up from the government side respected them enough that they um, nobody pressed the issue. They surrounded each other. They asked for permission to parade. Um, and sorry, I need to go back and say these when these men showed up in Northampton, they showed up to fife and drum music. They showed up in lines. They showed up looking like an army with guns on their shoulders. A quarter of them were armed. Um, but the part of the army that they were emulating was the discipline. They wanted to show explicitly that they were not a democratic mob of rough cut people come to overthrow government. They wanted to show the populace of Massachusetts that they were honest, hardworking farmers with integrity who had defended their country, who'd won, won their freedom and um, were here to protest an injustice. And they did that by keeping their guns at their shoulders. So with the two bodies of men, the government men and the, the, the people who called themselves regulators um, also, they were participating in a long, at least 15 year old tradition of um, taking the name of regulator as the people who were gonna regulate the country uh, for themselves, by themselves, in the absence of state justice. And that's very, already they're starting to feel like we're in this absence. We're in this with this place where the government isn't looking out for us. So we have to look out for ourselves. Um, so they um, asked for permission to parade. They paraded, you know, if you've ever seen military exercises, left, left right, oblique, back, return, stop. They did all of this work in the courtyard to show that they were obedient to orders, that they were a disciplined force, that they were um, the proud you know, citizen soldiers of uh, Massachusetts. And then when they were done parading, the government sent their troops into the courtyard and they put on their kind of step show in return to show that they were also uh, representing law and order from their side. Um, this is done, both armies go home. Again, nobody's thrown a stone through the court, through a courthouse window. Um, but September 2nd, <laughs> the reaction from Boston is this proclamation from James Bowden in which he claims that the people have introduced riot, anarchy and confusion into the state and basically claiming that this is gonna lead to the tyranny of you know, degenerate armed men running the government. So there's heavy duty fear mongering right out of the gate. There's diplomacy is not something that happened throughout. <laughs> these protests. Um, this, and the response from the state, from the people of Massachusetts was to say, okay, well, let's see what anarchy, riot, and confusion looks like. And they closed the courts in Worcester, Concord, Taunton, and Great Barrington. And in Great Barrington, um, and I love this story. I love telling the story because the people come out looking so good. They just were dignified and, and restrained and nonviolent start to finish with very few exceptions. Um, in Great Barrington, the militia is called out. It's one of the last courts to be closed. So on September 13th, they call the militia out. A thousand men line up with this militia to march into Great Barrington to protect the court. And one of the court's own judges, uh, William Whiting, steps out and says, well, whose side are we really on here? Who's to, to take sides of the road? Or if you're on the government side over here, if you're on the people side over here. And when that division had sorted itself all out, there's 800 men on the people's side of the road. And those are the people who were brought out to implement law and order. So whose law are we enforcing now, right? Because it's starting to look a lot like it's the people's law to say there should be debt relief. Um, and again, those 200 on the government side didn't press the issue. There was no violence at this court closing. Um, the um, that justice, William Whiting, uh, published a pamphlet after this saying that the government were overgrown plunderers who were just preying on the people, kind of ish, you know, echoing a lot of this Revolutionary War sentiment um, that the people had a right to determine their own conditions and should have more of a say in them. Uh, 
Um, but then <laughs> this sentiment was answered again, very strong terms from Boston. Samuel Adams publishes um, an article in the paper saying that it's one thing to rebel against the laws of a monarchy, that's kind of acceptable, but a man who re rebels against the, a rep an a elected republic ought to suffer death. And this again doesn't sit well with people who just fought a war for no pay um, and then came home and are finding themselves kind of in danger of being kicked off of their farms. Um, there we go. So what this does is it creates a strong reaction in the people who are now looking forward to the next set of courthouses opening. Um, and those are the criminal courts. And um, oh, let me see, here we are. So September 18th, a week later, less than a week after those courts are, um, are opened, the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, which is the criminal court in, meets in Worcester, and these judges would ride a circuit, right? This is why courts are described as circuits. Um, they get to their first stop in Worcester and they issue arrest warrants for um, Adam Wheeler and Henry and Abraham Gale and eight other men um, as leaders of this you know, rebellion insurrection, the, the terms vary for it. Um, and this, the, this heavy step, in addition to the rhetoric from Boston creates an outpouring of outrage from the people. And they start wanting to show up in Springfield on September 25th and really make a show of force. Um, as, they're, as the people who are running these protests are looking forward to the 25th and trying to figure out how they're gonna keep a lid on this thing, um, there's also what's known into history as the paper money riots in Exeter, New Hampshire, um, where Governor Sullivan has taken a similarly hard line to the line they've taken in Massachusetts, and hundreds of people have shown up to protest and demand paper money. And Sullivan has brought out a force of 2,000 men to arrest them, um, to humiliate the leaders, and he kept five of the men in prison um, in Exeter, New Hampshire. So this is just up the way from these protests in Massachusetts. And people are starting to wonder, are we gonna be facing you know, repression now if we show up and protest against these explicitly, again, explicitly, flagrantly unjust uh, economic policies. So this is when Daniel Shays is pulled in. Um, here we go. Um, Daniel Shays was, I, I find him a really fascinating character. Um, I think he was asked to lead because he had uh, buy-in. He had um, he had uh, authority with men of every rank. He was born the son of an indentured servant. He was the third child and first son. He hired out his labor from his, as soon as he could work for other people to bring in money, he was hiring out his labor. Um, and he married, ultimately married the daughter, kind of the adopted daughter of a wealthy landowner whose name, the, the Gilberts in Brookfield um, were, a, were you know, folks who had been around for some time. Abigail Gilbert's great-great-grandfather had built Gilbert's Fort in 1688, kind of when there was still you know, danger of war with the native people. That was right after, still right after um, what's known again inaccurately as King Philip's War. And there's, <laughs> there's another book uh, for that for another time um, to tell, to correct the, the ledger on that one. Um, then Daniel Shays was with with his dowry was um, raised to the rank of gentleman farmer. He bought a farm in Shutesbury, Mass. Then went off to war from there after having two kids. And um, in the war, he rose from the rank of ensign, which is just above um, the rank of, of uh, private, to the rank of to the commissioned rank of captain. Right. So now he's kind of in the elite class a little bit. Um, and he was asked at this point in September, as things are coming to a head, hey, can you step in? You've got authority with a lot of different people. The, the poor laborers respect you. The leadership class respects you. Can you come in and keep a lid on this? So he ends up marching out of Pelham um, with, I think, a couple hundred men uh, in September, marches down to Springfield, Mass., for the Supreme Judicial Court. And you know, by the time people are done drifting into Springfield, he's presiding over 2,000 men. Um, and they close not only the Springfield Supreme Judicial Court, but they also convince the judges to just abandon um, their plans to go out to Great Barrington to open that court as well. So it's kind of a two for one deal. Um, there is the, you know, the Springfield Arsenal um, is just up the hill from where this courthouse is. Uh, 
the men ignored it. And you know, the accusation is that these were degenerate farmers trying to arm themselves and wage, wage a war against the state of Massachusetts. Uh, this is their first opportunity to arm themselves from that arsenal where the federal government stockpiled weapons and provisions and gunpowder and cannon, and they just ignored it completely. Um, but now that the government has suffered you know, a string of six courts being closed um, and the official business being obstructed, um, there's more panic in Boston. So instead of sending diplomats, instead of trying to negotiate a solution here, they just start ratcheting down um, the repressive language. Um, they start by early October, there are rumors that Massachusetts is drafting a riot act. Um, Henry Knox is in Boston calling for federal troops to be stationed at the Springfield Arsenal. Um, they actually passed that through the federal Congress um, and raising his he requested 700 troops. They agreed to send 1,340. Um, and then all of the states except Virginia refused to fund that request. <laughs> so Massachusetts is, is playing, the, is casting itself as the victim in this. That you're going to antagonize the people and then not have the ability to enforce their laws. Um, as the, this threat of the Riot Act is circulating, um, a letter circulates over Daniel Shea's name. Um, asking people to keep, you know, asking the towns to keep their men ready with 60 rounds of ammunition uh, ready to march on a moment's notice. Um, I find this letter a little suspicious since most of the letters that circulated at this point were official documents that were signed by committees, signed by multiple men. Um, and Daniel Shays also complains, you know, in January, he's on the record complaining that no letters had been signed and put into circulation over his name without his permission. Um, Again, we're only two months, we're not even really two months into this, uh, into this campaign, and Henry Knox in Boston is warning George Washington uh, that 12 to 15,000 degenerate and unprincipled men are preparing to wage a war against the principle of liberty and the idea of good government. <laughs> um, again, they're trying to get George Washington out of retirement. Um, they're really creating the fear to refer to our contemporary politics that this was going to be a January 6th type moment instead of a um, kind of <clears throat> what we've seen as the kind of the social justice protests, um, which are more demonstrations and more nonviolent. Again, there was no violence in these organized protests at all across the board, no violence, no stones thrown through courthouse windows, nobody menaced, nobody beaten, um, just none of it. But the fears that they were creating were that the state was gonna be overthrown. Um, so when this letter gets to Boston over Daniel Shea's name, and it might have been written by somebody who wanted to create this outcome, uh, they pass the Riot Act, they suspend habeas corpus, and the Riot Act provisions are enough to get people off the couch to defend their liberties, because if you are in a crowd of armed people, if there's a gun in the crowd and you're told to disperse and you stay, you're liable to be arrested, taken to Boston to be imprisoned, where you will be whipped 39 stripes every three months um, for a period of up to a year. Your property will be taken by the state and probably most offensive is that the deputies who were charged to arrest these folks were indemnified against any damages if they killed or injured the protesters. So it looks to the people like they're just flooding back toward tyranny um, as the, uh, government is passing these measures kind of one after the other. And the government, and so as they're watching these measures come in, the, the next date that's on the calendar is November 21st, because that's the next round of court, of court dates are going to start in Worcester on November 21st. And everybody's starting to wonder, all right, what's going to happen on November 21st? And we remember what's going to happen on January 6th. It's kind of the same pressure. Which way is it going to go? Because everybody saw it coming and they saw these conditions being set up. Um, for some violent confrontations. And the government, as a way of, you know, trying to defuse things, offered pardons for people who participated in the protests, but they issued no reforms. So you could be free, you could go back to your farm and, and suffer the economic injustices, but you wouldn't be in danger for protesting. <laughs> Needless to say, this didn't, this didn't dissolve the populace, it just kind of hardened their resolve. So they show up at November 21st, they show up in Worcester, uh, Daniel Shays and 350 picked men, um, in addition to Adam Wheeler, Abraham and um, 
uh, I forget the other Gale, Henry and Abraham Gale's name, um, Henry and Abraham Gale and the Worcester folks closed the Worcester court. There's no opposition. Uh, but what's interesting now is there's snows come down. And so the people are starting to feel like it's hard to move armies around in Massachusetts in the snow. So if we can just get this into the cold, we'll be good till April, right? We can just worry about all of this down the road. Um, they close that court. The, there's no opposition. There's no violence. Um, however, a week later, uh, November 28th, the government sends 400 horsemen in search of some leaders, and they arrest Job Shattuck from Groton, in addition to two other men who are taken to Boston. And when Job Shattuck is arrested, he resists arrest, and a Harvard graduate named Jonathan Hickborn slashes at him, gets him behind the knee, severs the tendons in his leg, and cripples him for life. And now there's blood on the snow. And now people are waiting for things to blow. And Daniel Shays is at the head of this party who's trying to keep things under control. And there's starting to be signs that he doesn't want to be there. <laughs> um, it doesn't sound like an enviable position. Um, however, testament to the respect he, he had earned, uh, nothing happened. And nothing happened for the next month and a half. They went back to Worcester. They closed another court on December 5th. Um, the history is really skimp on this period. They're just kind of going action point to action point. But Daniel Shays then spent three weeks. He couldn't go home because he was liable to be arrested. So he spent three weeks um, riding through central Massachusetts and down to Connecticut to recruit men, to recruit promises of support, to recruit some money and commitments to fight if it went that far. Um, these, you know, depending on who you talk to, you're going to hear that he was recruiting an army. Uh, other people are just going to say he was recruiting support. Um, December 26th comes around, the last courthouse of the year, court uh, date of the year. Uh, Daniel Shays is in Springfield with Luke Day and Thomas Grover from Montague, Mass, and 300 men, and they close that court as well. And the sheriff writes to jo James Bowden in Boston and says, I don't know, we didn't expect this. This totally took us by surprise as a way of not being responsible for it. But of course, the report that the people are so powerful and clandestine that they could stage this without detection uh, doesn't make things, uh, doesn't make people feel better about stuff in Boston. Um, so in Boston, James Bowden is, has had enough of this. He's starting to recruit funding for an army. He raised uh, 6,000 pounds from his wealthy friends to field an army that was supposed to be 4,400 people strong. It ended up being about 3,000 people. Um, the legislature was not in session. The legislature never approved this army. This was something that James Bowden did as governor and you know, believed he could make that legal retroactively. Um, th that army was supposed to march from Boston on the 19th. Um, in advance of that, James Bowden issued arrest warrants for Daniel Shays and 16 other leaders. So all those towns that were in green around the, the court towns, um, the, you know, and sometimes it was arbitrary. Sometimes that's the only place those names show up in the record is in this arrest warrant. It's not clear that those people were agitating or were leading large numbers of men. And there's kind of a sense that the government was just lashing out at whichever ringleaders they thought they could get at. Um, and sometimes they're just settling private scores, settling, settling some old scores from other kind of rural grudges. Um, nevertheless, the people decide to gather in um, three places around Springfield. Um, Luke Day is going to have about 600 men uh, west of uh, Springfield, in West Springfield, north of West Spring, north of Springfield in um, Chicopee, Eli Parsons. Uh, we'll have another 400, um, and Eli Parsons is an artillery officer who'd marched with George Washington and um, crossed the river with him um, in that first year of the war. Um, and Daniel Shays is going to have another, you know, 1,000 to 1,200 people up in Pelham, and they call themselves together, and they don't do anything. <laughs> they just waited um, the goal was the um, Springfield Arsenal. They knew that that was the place that the government was going to be focused on because there were weapons and provisions there. Um, the accusation has been that the people were trying to arm themselves and overthrow the government. Um, I really can't see this any other way except that the people were trying to um, 
keep those weapons out of the government's hands because they knew they would be used against them. Um, and to make one last ditch attempt to, um, to negotiate some peace. They didn't move until after General Benjamin Lincoln had left Worcester with 3,000 men. So now he's three days out from Springfield, three days out from coming into the heart of Western Massachusetts and starting to set up um, martial law. And that's when the people said, okay, fine, we finally have to go. Um, so January 24th, they headed out um, to be in uh, Springfield on the 25th. And I'm gonna go. So this is what they found uh, when they showed up at the 25th that um, General Westfield General um, William Shepard had brought about 900 or 1,000 men uh, into the arsenal grounds. He had um, brought some cannon out from inside the storehouses. And when the people marched up, um, they were arrayed out against them in the road. The people, you know, Daniel Shays had met two uh, different kind of diplomats had come out to ask what his intentions were. He said he wanted barracks and stores. Um, he said he was there to defend his country. And um, he was told that he, he told them that he wasn't going to stop. So he marched his, his men up uh, in by platoons is the record, which is, which is to say eight across. So they're marching up in disciplined lines, eight across. Uh, the roads are narrow. There's been a lot of snow this winter. And um, they take warning shots. Two shots went over their heads, didn't hit anything. And then when they kept coming, uh, General William Shepard said to lower the cannon to waistband height. And he fired these shots you see down here on the left side of the screen, which is grape shot, which is kind of like a shotgun shell for a cannon. So you can see all of those iron balls that are held together by twine. In the cannon, that twine dissolves. And what comes out of that cannon just is a spray of these balls. Um, they hit those, those lines. Um, four men in those first three lines were killed, and the other 20. So if they're marching by eights, the first three lines are just wiped out by these balls. Um, the 1,200 men who are lined up, again, by eights. So this column went for some time. <laughs> they kind of turn themselves inside out and disappear. They turn around. They never fired a shot back. They just retreated to cries of murder, murder, right? Now they are the victims they can show that the government is, has been oppressing them, has been you know, using violence against them, uh, and they retreat to Ludlow. And then this is a sketch by Ezra Stiles, a uh, contemporary sketch. Um, you can see General Lincoln coming in on the 27th, 23rd, he says. Uh, Lincoln didn't arrive in Springfield till the 27th. Um, Daniel Shays at that point is in Chicopee, gathering, you know, merging forces with um, Eli Parsons. Luke Day is still in West Springfield. I, I need to back up and say neither of those guys showed up with their forces. Daniel Shays was the only force to show up. Luke Day had decided, or his pastor, apparently, the story is that Luke Day's pastor told him he would be in danger of murder if any of his men were killed in this encounter, in this confrontation. So he said, hey, I want a one day delay. Uh, but Daniel Shays never got that note. It was intercepted. Um, so Eli Parsons got the note. He stayed and waited till the next day. Daniel Shays didn't get the note. So William Shepard, the general at the arsenal, was able to concentrate all of his forces on the eastern approach. And again, it needs to be said, Daniel Shays didn't make a military approach. Only one in four had uh, muskets. Only one in 10 of those had bayonets. Um, they just marched up and demanded the, the barracks and stores. They, they were not making a military approach surrounding the grounds, looking for weaknesses in the defenses. Um, they were just there to, uh, to make this demand and to negotiate a peace. Um, what happened in the next few days was basically Daniel Shays ended up up in Pelham. General Benjamin Lincoln is in, Hat, is in um, Hadley, Mass, about um, 12 miles apart. And then finally, Daniel Shea says, we need to remove further. They go to Petersham, Mass. General Benjamin Lincoln makes an overnight march. And he starts out, it's a full moon, full moon night on, on February 3rd. He marches into this toward this full moon going east. And then the clouds come in, the snow starts coming down. And by the time he arrives in Petersham, Massachusetts to, to disperse Shea's force, there's 18 inches of fresh snow on the ground. So it's kind of this heroic feat. Daniel Shea's men all disperse. Shays ends up in um, 
crossing, they go north into uh, New Hampshire, cross the frozen Connecticut River north of Brattleboro, and then follow the roads up toward um, kind of the pass between Stratton Mountain and Grout, Grout Pond, coming out on the western side of Vermont by Arlington, which is where Ethan Allen's farm was. And then they end up a lot of, there was about 300 men came with him, end up camped on land near Ethan Allen. Um, Daniel Shays had a sister and brother-in-law in, -in um, Bennington. He had a sister across the border from there in Cambridge, New York, um, sorry, in Salem, New York. And um, Vermont was an independent republic at the time, right? So they were fleeing the country and the laws of the Art Articles of Confederation weren't gonna allow Benjamin Lincoln to cross state lines to come after them. So what started as a nonviolent protest campaign ends up looking a lot more like a refugee story as Daniel Shays and these 300 men are looking for, um, looking for asylum in Vermont and the people in Vermont didn't wanna give it to them. They didn't want the political troubles. They didn't wanna be dragged into this. They wanted to be kind of left out. Um, let's see if I can get this to go. So. When Daniel Shays uh, you know, petitioned, he rode as far north as Williston and then as far north as Quebec, asking for asylum first from, General, from um, Tom Chittenden and then from Canadian Lord General, uh, or um, Canadian Governor, um, Lord Dorchester. Everybody said, we can't, we don't wanna get involved. And they ended up down in Egg Mountain uh, in Sandgate, Vermont, which has now been excavated by this fellow, Steve Butts from, um, I think Cambridge, New York, found this stuff up on a snowmobiling trip and started digging and is turning up all this really beautiful 18th century, um, these artifacts uh, that are coming up from the ground there, um, which fascinating project. Um, so there should have been, here we go. Um, and Daniel Shays is in exile. There is sporadic violence in Massachusetts. Um, you know, people are settling private scores, burning each other's uh, warehouses down, really small handful of, of problems. Um, but April 1st comes along, the people go to the polls. John Hancock is elected in like a three to one landslide to come back into office, to start issuing pardons, issue reforms, change the economic policies. James Bowden realizes that, you know, things are going against him. So he decides that it's, he better start getting on the other side of things. Um, and so he starts issuing pardons and the temperature just starts coming down uh, from that point. And there are these, these fellows, Parmenter and McCuller were, were held for um, hanging and they just kind of kept bumping that along and stringing it out and letting you know, time lapse and, and bumping it until they were ultimately reprieved on the gallows in um, June of 1787. So um, wrapping this up, um, it's the reason I kept following this story to tell this, uh, to bring this story out, was it really wasn't the insurrection uh, they were telling you about. And I think that the actual story here um, is a fascinating one about this proud tradition we have as Americans of nonviolent opposition, people getting together, banding together with their neighbors and saying, we can tolerate inequality, like that's part of, that's built in, but we're not gonna tolerate injustice. Um, and what I really got to see as this project went on was the degree to which any agitation was just turned into propaganda um, against the people, to turn the people against each other, to discredit each other. Um, but, you know, the system worked then, and we've seen the system work here, where the people, if they agitate enough, can change things through elections. So um, that's pretty much the story that I found. I did a certain, you know, again, people's history from the people's perspective. Um, <clears throat> in the book. So it doesn't read like a history. It reads um, more like a narrative. And um, I'm happy to take questions about really any part of this. <laughs> I've steeped myself in this history long enough. It's really a delight to talk about it with folks who are curious. So um, thanks again, John. Thanks to the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. And I'll look forward to questions and discussion. Well, thank you very much, Dan, for retelling this fascinating story of Shay's Rebellion. For those of you who are uh, watching this on Sunday afternoon, the 16th, a reminder that uh, if you go to the link that you might have received, Devon 013 at, uh, I'm sorry, that go to the link that I sent you at the Zoom link, you can uh, join us in a conversation over Zoom. 
If you did not get that link, send me an email at devinal13 at comcast.net, and I will uh, send you the link so you can uh, join us in that way. Um, and one last reminder, uh, let me put my, my address up here so you can uh, get that. Uh, February is Black History Month. In, observ in observance of Black History Month, the Homestead, Ethan Homestead will have a book discussion on February 7th. It's um, in the evening, I think believe it's a Monday evening. And uh, the book that will be discussed is uh, Harvey Amani Whitfield's The Problem of Black Slavery in Early Vermont. If you would like to join us for that book discussion, go to the Ethan Allen website, ethanallenhomestead.org, look at the calendar and click on February 7th and all the information is there on how to get the book and how to join the book discussion. And there's no, no cost for the book discussion. So again, thank you for joining us today. And th thanks again, Dan, for this uh, great talk today. Great, thanks so much. See you guys in the talk.